Thank you for your prayers this uh, past week. I am happy to report that the Lord has heard the prayers of his saints, and Emily and I on Friday were able to close on our house in New Orleans. <clears throat> so thank you very much for, for praying. You can continue praying for the Dudleys now. Uh, they're under contract on a house as of last night, and uh, they've submitted an, or sorry, they've submitted an offer. They're not under contract yet, but they're waiting to hear back from the sellers, and um, even with those things outstanding, all three families are poised to move to New Orleans uh, at the end of this month. We'll be, Lord willing, uh, driving out on a week, three weeks from tomorrow. So the, the Monday following our final Sunday on the 29th. So uh, that's uh, an update for you and enough about houses and homes in New Orleans. Uh, it's going to be good for us to turn our attention to a greater house in a different city from the book of Haggai. So let me pray and we'll jump in. God, thank you for the precious promises that you have made to your people, promises that wait, await their fulfillment soon. And from your perspective, you've even told us that it's only a little while. And so help us to greet these promises with eyes of faith that think of them as coming soon, as only a little bit longer before they are fulfilled. And God, I pray that you would make those great glorious truths that are coming to shape and dominate our lives in the present. And even as we look at this passage from Haggai, I pray that you would make us more apt to live in the present with the future in mind. And we ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. There's a book that I want to commend to you. It's at our book table. We've featured this book in years past. It's titled Plain and Simple Thoughts for Children and Parents. And the author, William S. Plummer, used to preach short sermons to children. And aside from those sermons being short, I'm sure they were great. This book is filled with short stories and sermons with practical wisdom for families. And I want to just read from one of those entries entitled, Acorns Make Oaks. Acorns Make Oaks. And in it, Plummer has this to say to his young readers. Bad boys are not apt to make good men. Good boys are not apt to make bad men. Boys sometimes seem to be good for a while, but you do not know their hearts and deeds or else you would not call them good. When they grow up and all at once seem to turn out badly, you may be sure that is not the first time they have been in great sin. A lady in Hartford, Connecticut has told the world about the boy that became a traitor. She says, and then he goes on to quote this writer at length, quote, there are few things more disgraceful in children than to be cruel to those harmless creatures which are not able to defend themselves. If I see a child pull off the wings of an insect or throw stones at a toad or take pains to set his foot upon a worm, I am sure there is something wrong about him or that he has not been well instructed. There was once a boy that loved to give pain to everything that came in his way, over which he could get any power. He would take the eggs from the morning robin and torture the unfledged sparrow, cats and dogs, the peaceable cow and the faithful horse. He delighted to worry and distress. I do not like to tell you of the many cruel things that he did. He was told that such deeds were wrong. An excellent lady with whom he used to live 
used to warn him and reprove him for his evil conduct, but he did not reform. When he grew up, he became a soldier. He was never sorry to see men wounded and blood running upon the earth. He became so wicked as to lay a plan to betray his country and sell it into the hands of the enemy. This is to be a traitor. But he was discovered and fled. He never dared to return to his native land, but lived despised and died miserably in a foreign clime. Such was the end of the cruel boy who loved to give pain to animals. His name was Benedict Arnold. He was born at Norwich in Connecticut, and the beautiful city of his birth is ashamed of his mem memory, end quote. And then Plummer adds, bad boys will be very apt to make bad men for the very reason that acorns make oaks. Now, why am I reading this children's story to you? Well, besides my uh, attempt to get every attention of every child in the room and offer wise advice to children, I also want us to consider the principle that is at play in that story. And it is this, what we think about the future really shapes how we live in the present. It's one of the morals of that story. Uh, to think about a child growing up to become something and to have the end in mind really shapes what you think about, what you go after, what you pursue, how you train the child in the present. To know that, as this story illustrates with Benedict Arnold, cruel boys can become treacherous, traitorous men. A wise parent would be wise to train that child for a better future and seek to raise them in such a way that now would give them the best chance become, to become what they want them to be in the future. Now this is clear, just natural, obvious uh, fact of life that what we think about the future shapes how we live in the present even down to the practical illustration of parenting. But the same principle does hold true theologically. What we think, what you think, Christian, about the future shapes how you live in the present. Another way to say that is that your eschatology matters. If we don't think much, for example, about the future, or if we're confused about the future, then that too bears its own fruit, right? If you don't think much about the future, then you're probably characterized by a lack of urgency in the present, or perhaps unrepentant hard-heartedness to not believe what God says about the unrepentant, those who persist in hard-heartedness, the kind of fruit that that would bear in one's life is a hard-hearted disregard for upright living. Uh, to use Proverbs 1.32, for example, those who have a complacent, apathetic attitude toward God's wisdom today in the present is because they do not believe what God has said about the end of the fool, the one who rejects God's wisdom, and then reaps the destruction that comes on those who do such things. And so like the Jews in Haggai's day, even those who, uh, to think about this principle, what we think about the future shapes how we live in the present, like the Jews in Haggai's day, failure to consider the truth regarding the future will result in wrong priorities, right? We will forget to prioritize what is most important from God's perspective in the here and now if we don't have a clear view of the future, of the end. And so like them, we'll fail to prioritize God's gracious or favorable presence among us as well as his enduring promises. And if we don't prioritize these things in the here and now, then again, 
like the Jews in Haggai's day, will fail to practice the obedience that is practiced by all those who inherit those future promises, who one day enter into the kingdom. What we think about the future shapes how we live in the present. And so it's for good reason, for this reason, that God through Haggai gives his people a glorious glimpse into the future in order to sustain their present day obedience, which was the work of rebuilding the temple. And so with that, I want us to turn our attention to verse 1 in chapter 2 of Haggai. Follow along as I read. On the 21st of the seventh month, the word of Yahweh came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Who among you remains who saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares Yahweh. Be strong also, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all you people of the land. Be strong, declares Yahweh, and work, for I am with you, declares Yahweh of hosts. As for the promise which I cut with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is standing in your midst. Do not fear. For thus says Yahweh of hosts, once more in a little while I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations and they will come with the desirable things of, the nation, of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares Yahweh of hosts. In this passage, there are three unified acts that sustain the rebuilding of the temple. That's our our outline for this morning. We will see three unified acts. They all go together. They walk hand in hand. Each of them is necessary to accomplish this goal, sustaining the rebuilding of the temple. This is God's way at this point in Israel's history, as they undertake the work of rebuilding the temple, this is God's perfect plan for urging them on so that their hands don't fail at this point in the work. He wants them to see the work all the way through, and so he's going to sustain their obedience with these three occurrences. And I'll just give you all of those right up front. These three acts are the arrival of God's word, Number one, the arrival of God's word, the assessment of Israel's work, and then the announcement of God's will. The arrival of God's work, the, assess- the, the arrival of God's word, the assessment of Israel's work, and the announcement of God's will. And let's take these one at a time. First, notice the arrival of God's word. Here we are again seeing God's word coming perfectly timed to bring a word to his people in verse 1. Notice when God's word arrives, it says, the word of the Lord came, again, by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. This isn't the first time that we've seen this. This word comes by Haggai's hand, and so it is, first off, timely, In verse 1, the specific timing of when this word came. On the 21st, that is the 21st day of the seventh month, this word came. 
This is the 21st day of the month Tishri by the Jewish calendar. Uh, By our calendar, this would have been October 17th in the year 520 B.C. October 17th, 520 B.C. And it's no coincidence that this would have been the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles. This was exactly 440 years to the day that Solomon had finished and dedicated his temple. So it's a memorable, historic day that this word comes to Haggai. It's on a feast day, and this is 26 days that had elapsed since the construction began. Just look back in verse 15. The construction began, they began doing the work on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. And so the very next verse gives us what's 26 days later when now another word comes to the prophet Haggai to encourage the people in their work. Now at this point, one commentator helpfully notes 26 days had passed since construction began, and already the differences between the two temples were becoming painfully evident. They were becoming painfully evident. We'll get to this, but in verse 3, he just asks those who were present to compare the works, and it seems like nothing in their eyes. So that's the situation. The word has to come because even though they're being obedient, they recognize the, in comparison, the shame of the work they're working on. And so God's word is timely, not only that it's in its specificity, it comes on a specific day, it's a feast day, not only in that it arrives soon, only 26 days after the last word they received, But it's also timely in the season that it comes, being that encouragement and comfort and urging on is necessary. So the arrival of God's word is timely. It's also divine. Again, we've seen these things again or before in this book. Every time the word comes, it is not the word of Haggai only, but it is the word of the Lord, the word of Yahweh. So it's divine in that sense. God is the source of this word ultimately. And not only is it timely divine, but it's written. It comes by the hand of Haggai. It was written down for the people to read in a letter fashion, like the New Testament epistles. This is a similar word from God, coming by the hand of Haggai, and it's prophetic. Timely, divine, written, prophetic. It comes by the hand of Haggai, the prophet. He is the mouthpiece of God at this time, having all the credentials to speak on behalf of the God of the universe. And so with all those things being present, This is how God's word arrives. And when God's word arrives, verse 2, we now see number two, the assessment of Israel's work. The assessment of Israel's work. The word came saying, verse 2, speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. He's the governor of Judah to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. These are the groups or the persons addressed when the word comes. And so when God now turns to assess the work, he has three groups in mind or persons. Zerubbabel and Joshua, we've seen them a couple times before. They are the leadership layer, civil and religious leadership in Israel, but then to them is added the remnant of the people. 
what's left, the remnant, what's left of the people. All three groups are in mind. They're the ones being addressed. And that's significant for reasons we'll discover in just a second. Just notice, besides who's addressed, we get now what's assessed in verse 3. Who among you remains who saw this house in its former glory? So you have here the need for witnesses, sort of this call for witnesses. Who is it among all the remnant who got a glimpse of the first house, the first temple, the one that Solomon built, and God just calls their attention to it? There's a few uh, a group, apparently, of very old men, old men and women present in the remnant who have now returned back to Jerusalem, who now stand as witnesses of both temples. The first one, Solomon built, and now the second one, that Zerubbabel's tasked with building. And they can speak to both houses. <laughs> And he says, how do you see it now? So there's this criterion sort of four witnesses. You saw the house in its former glory. And then their perspective, how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? It, the, the comparison certainly would have already been made among the people. You're a month, uh, just under a month underway. And as this thing is being constructed again, the people are being obedient. And at whatever point they've progressed, it is becoming painfully obvious this temple isn't going to be the same temple. It is going to lack the glory that Solomon's temple had. And even the length of the discourses in Scripture would bear witness to that fact. Many chapters discuss the temple, the original temple, and now just in a couple of verses, they, they did the work. But it's going to lack the same glory. It's important to just notice that God is the one who is calling their attention to this. Whatever the people might have been saying, God's just going to be honest and upfront and just puts that reality front and center. Hey, I know what you think about it. I know what you're thinking. I know what you're saying amongst yourselves. And I'm just going to make the point. Doesn't it seem like nothing? Look at it. I think that this is just uh, for us. God calls to just think about the reality that God calls their attention to inglorious obedience, right? Their, their obedience that they've undertaken, God acknowledges that it lacks glory. It's nothing to marvel at. It's nothing that is, seems worthy of being recorded in the history books, right? To think about them for 26 days. We don't get any details really about what they've been doing. It's just not noteworthy. And, and that is good for us to remember because day after day, how many acts of obedience do you undertake that are worthy of the history books? Not many, right? Not many. Why is this helpful for us to remember? Because what's about to unfold is tremendous blessing, tremendous comfort and encouragement to continue on in the inglorious work that they've started. So to think of all of our obedience, not noteworthy, most of it, as worthy of God's notice, worthy of God's comfort, warranting God's encouragement. Look at what he just, look at what he tells them. 
be strong in verse 4. We get that three times. Be strong, be strong, be strong. Work. You mean at that, that rinky-dink temple we're building? Yes. <laughs> work. It's a good work. Keep on. Get after it. All of those things that are going unnoticed by people of great regard at this point in Israel's history, day after day in our own lives, God sees, God notices, God says, continue on. Be strong and work is the implication. And that it's just helpful to remember that our obedience and God's notice is not based on the greatness of the work. It's not based on greatness, but it's based on faithfulness. God was the one that told them to do this work. And so when they did it, it didn't matter how lacking in glory it, had, it was. It was a good work that they were undertaking. So be encouraged, Christian. Every thought, every small deed, every meager effort undertaken by you in faithfulness to God is worth it. Perhaps we won't be reading about those things. Maybe. You know, maybe one day in a hundred years from now, people say there was this little church in Tempe and they had plans to send the gospel far and wide, far beyond their resources, far beyond their ability. They sent three families in one year to Papua New Guinea, to the other side of the world. And look what has resulted. Maybe. They sent another family to New Orleans. <laughs> and look what has resulted. They could not have dreamed that their small, faithful efforts would yield these kinds of fruit. Maybe. Maybe not. God knows. And so we labor. Thirdly, we should notice from this passage the announcement of God's will. The announcement of God's will. And really, God's will is unfolded for us in this passage in several imperatives or commands. They just unfold in rapid succession. We've already noted a few of them. Verse 4, but now be strong, right? Re regardless of the, the nothingness that this current work seems to you, Regardless of that, be strong. Zerubbabel. Then be strong, Joshua. And then, again, be strong. And this is to all you people of the land. Be strong and do what? Well, and work. <laughs> and work. This is not be strong and take a break, reflect on how faithful you've been so far. Nope, keep your head down and labor on. Be strong and work. And then this, this comfort, for I am with you. What we're going to see, three God's will unfolds in three series, if you will, of, of commands and along with each of those commands comes a rationale or a reason to follow the command. So there's a, hey, it's God's will that you do this, and here's why. So we get commands and then reasons or a rationale for why to obey those commands. And so here's what those, those are, the way I've, I've summarized these. As God announces his will, what is his will for his people? Strength, perseverance, and courage. 
strength, perseverance, and courage. And as we walk through these, we'll see the, the similar implications for each in each of these for our own lives. First strength, be strong. There it is, be strong. And three times this command comes. I want you to notice in verse four, again, to whom this command to be strong comes. Zerubbabel, Jehozadak, all the people of the land. First, Zerubbabel and Jehozadak are in view. The first time we saw these men mentioned is in verse one and two. Uh, verse one, the whole prophecy begins addressed to these men, the leaders, Zerubbabel and Jehozadak. And then in verse two, it moves on to address the people. It says this people, sort of God again distancing himself in, in his language from the people. It's this people, not my people. We see in verse 12, the same three groups mentioned, or same three recipients mentioned, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, with all the people, the remnant of the people. But in verse 12, they actually turn in repentance. They listen and fear the Lord when the word comes. The same groups are mentioned in verse 4 when Yahweh stirs up or awakens, causes the spirit of Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the remnant of the people to awaken. He causes that to happen. And then again in our passage, verse 2, the same groups were mentioned, Zerubbabel, Jehozadak, the remnant. So when the encouragement now finally comes, be strong, be strong, be strong, What's the point? The encouragement came to each of the three groups who responded to God's instruction, Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the remnant. Don't forget verse 12 of chapter 1. When that instruction, when that rebuke came, all of them together, Zerubbabel, Jehozadak, and the remnant of the people did two things. They listened and fear the Lord. They listen to, to God through his prophet, and they fear the Lord. All, all three of those addressed. So now that the encouragement comes, it comes to each of those. And I think the takeaway for us is all those who listen and fear the Lord then get the encouragement that comes from God when they respond in obedience. You want to be encouraged? You want to be comforted by God's comfort? Listen and fear the Lord. You can have God's comfort. By contrast, if you do not listen, if you do not fear the Lord, then God's comfort is not for you. Don't expect the comfort to come so long as you are unwilling to listen and fear the Lord. Another helpful reminder is that the comfort actually comes, again, 16 years after their delayed obedience. They had laid the foundation. Here we are 16 years later, and God is still eager to comfort and encourage the ones who have responded to his instruction. So wherever you might be, maybe you're thinking, I'm 16 years plus late on responding in some way to God's word. It's still not too late for you. Turn, listen, fear God. You, as soon as you do, then God's comfort is ready. God's comfort will come to you. He will, as we've already seen in verse 13 of chapter 1, here again in verse 4, be with you, even in your meager acts of obedience. So what they need first, and God's will for them first, is strength. And here's the 
rationale why to be strong. Why be strong at the end of verse 4? Because for I am with you. I am with you. His favorable presence. God is with them as they listen, as they fear him, as they obey him. He is with them. He is for them as they pursue him in obedience to him. One other detail worth noting in verse 4. All you people of the land, of the land. That is, that is a kind way for God to address his people. That is a kind way for God to address his people. He first called them this people, but now that they've responded, he can now be called, as we've already noted last week, their God in verse 14 of chapter 1. They, did, they came and they did work on the house of Yahweh of hosts, their God. Now that they are a God-fearing people, it's worth calling them their God, uh, or as if they, are, they have owned God, they have laid claim to him again and treated him as their sovereign. But now God even calls them the people of the land. Praise God. They're not the people uh, who've been removed from the land as a disobedient people when they were. But now they're the people of the land. They're back obeying God and he is going to bless them in his place. They are the people of the land. And so because God is favorably among them, they are strengthened to continue the work. The next, the next aspect of the announcement of God's will is their perseverance. This is the next need because he says, and work. And again, this shares the same reason why. Work because I am with you. So God's favorable presence becomes the rationale for why they can be strong and why they can work. So they've already started the work, but his command here as they're working to tell them be strong and work is really calling for their continuance in the work, their, their ongoing labors, their perseverance in their obedience. And God's presence among them ought to urge them on in their obedience. Just to give you just one other reference where this principle is at play in the Great Commission, how does Jesus finish his words in the Great, Great Commission. You disciple all nations, right? Go and disciple all nations as the one with all authority. Here's what I'm tasking you to do. And as you do that, teaching, baptizing disciples, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded, here's the comfort. As you go about doing that work, I am with you, even to the end of the age. So every church, like Grace Bible Church, who continues that good work of discipling nations, we are drawing in men and women, discipling them, building them out, and then sending them out. As we labor in that biblical commission, then we can trust that God is among us. And to the degree that we cease to do that, that we veer from that instruction from the Lord, then we should know Jesus ceases to be among us to that degree. So long as they are obeying in this way, they can trust that God is with them in their labors. The final announcement or aspect of the announcement of God's will so necessary for the people at this crucial time where they're tempted certainly to be discouraged and, and cease the work. They need strength, perseverance, and then finally courage. They need courage to actually do this. You remember the reason the work stopped the first time was because they had enemies surrounding them who were seeking to interrupt the work, who got the kings at the time involved 
to make them stop the work by force even. And so it's not like all of their enemies have magically gone away. No, they, they're still opposed on every side. Even today, it's the same. Israel is surrounded by enemies. Just a, a couple of days ago, attacks came against Israel, surprise attacks. They are literally surrounded by enemies. It's not hard for their enemies to have access to attack this little people, insignificant nation on the map. And so in this day, in Haggai's day, it was the same. So what else do they need? They need courage to undertake this despite the opposition that they're experiencing. And so he tells them, finally, in these, in these last few verses, do not fear. Look at verse 5. Haggai goes on, As for the promise which I cut with you, says the Lord, when you came out of Egypt, my spirit is standing in your midst, and, he, and here's our command, do not fear. This is the call for courage. Do not fear. One thing I want you to notice is that this command, this word, takes the same form, the same shape as the ones that we've just seen. Be strong, be strong, be strong, work all commands. Do not fear is the same. It's a command. They were called, as much as to whatever degree fear is an emotion, to whatever degree fear affects the emotional life of man, they were called to control their emotions and not be afraid. And in our day, there's a, a, a group of uh, teachers in the biblical counseling movement, in the biblical counseling world that wants to soften this as a command. It's not really a command because that would be unkind to tell somebody who's afraid to stop being afraid. And so what God is doing here is he's just um, encouraging them. You don't have to be afraid. Well, he doesn't tell them you don't have to be afraid. He tells them to not be afraid. It's a command, and they are capable because, as we've already seen in verse 14 of chapter 1, who is ultimately empowering this work? God is. He's the one that's stirring them up to obey. And so when it comes to being strong, being strengthened, when it comes to persevering, working, and when it comes to having courage, not being afraid, they're not looking to themselves to accomplish these things. They are trusting by faith that God is the one who is ultimately at work in them to enable their obedience. And so they are able because God is working. We are able to obey because God is working. And each of the, the, the rationales for, for all of these things that unfold, and we'll uh, move through the, the last set of rationales briefly, but just notice, just remember in each of the rationales that's coming, when God gives them reasons to go obey, he doesn't direct their attention inward ever. He doesn't say, you can do it. Look at something great in yourself. There is nothing great in them, just like there's nothing great in us. On, on their own resources, with their own resources, they didn't obey for 16 years. That's enough time for them to throw in the towel on their own resources and look to God now. And so God directs their attention to the resources that he provides, to his own character, his favorable presence, and then as we'll see, past promises, his presence currently, and future plans, all of these things will fuel obedience in the here and now. So we should look to God and his resources as motivation to go obey. Where you, Christian, see weak obedience, weak attempts, failing, attempts at obedience in your own life, 
Where should you give your attention? The Lord. What am I not believing about God? Where do I need to grow in my knowledge of God? What truth about God and about what he has said about his plans for the future am I just not mindful enough of that I'm not motivated enough to obey? That's where you should look. In those areas of besetting sin that you're all too acutely aware of, where you just are frustrated because of your lack of obedience, take inventory. As he's already told Israel, set your heart upon your ways, put it on the calendar, wake up early, open your Bible and a journal, and say, what am I not believing about God that I'm continuing to fail to walk in obedience? And just look at passage after passage. God, what's true about you? That will motivate me to obey. This final act or or announcement of God's will to not fear, the reasons to not fear begin in verse 5. And it has first to do this rationale with God's past promises. So there's going to be a few aspects in this rationale that's going to fuel their obedience. Before the rationale was just one simple thing. I am with you. So God's favorable presence was enough to strengthen them and cause them to persevere, be strong in work. God's favorable presence would accomplish that. But here, he gives us a lengthy word, some, uh, lots of details. And so all of this becomes the rationale for why they should not fear. And I'll just tell you, It includes, the rationale includes God's past promises, God's present presence, and God's future plans. So it's interesting, the the rationale has a past, present, and future aspect to it. And this past, present, future aspect addresses God's promises, God's presence, and God's plans. Notice in verse 5 how he calls attention to his past promises. Uh, There's difficulty in in the translation here. I think a a helpful way of translating what's happening in the original is to say, I am he who cut a promise with you when you came out of Egypt. I know that's uh, not what your English versions say. Translators are trying to decide what to do with a phrase here in the original. I think the most helpful way and that makes sense of the context is that God is saying, I am the one who did this in the past. I am he who cut a covenant with you or cut a promise when you came out of Egypt. And with that, he's calling attention to a couple different aspects of the past. It's a reminder of the covenant or the promise that he made when they were at Sinai. And it's a reminder of him fulfilling his promise to rescue them from Egypt. I'll just show you this briefly. In Genesis chapter 15, again, all roads lead back to Torah. God first told Abraham or Abram before his name was changed that this would happen. There would be an exodus. Genesis 15, starting in verse 13, then God said to Abram, know for certain that your seed will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for a hundred years. But I will also judge the nation to whom they are enslaved, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. So the Exodus was foreshadowed, foretold rather, even to Abraham. And then he says, as for you, you'll go down to your fathers in peace. You'll be buried in a good old age, verse 16. Then in the fourth generation, they will return here. He's in Canaan. For the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So they'll be enslaved and then they'll return. So a reminder of the Exodus is in view because he says, when you came out of Egypt, 
in, back in Haggai, but then also a reminder of the covenant. And you can write down Exodus 24, verse 8. Uh, we've seen Exodus 24. This is that same passage where Moses comes down from Sinai, tells the people what God said. He wrote it down. Then he read, read it to them the next day. And then he throws blood on everybody to say, hey, I'm ratifying the covenant. You said you would obey God. You got his word. He said he would be your God and you would be his people. And you said, amen to that covenant. Here's blood. This is sealing the deal. So he's reminding them in Haggai, I'm the same God. I was with you at Horeb or Sinai. I'm that same God. And the one, I'm the one who rescued you from Egypt. Today, what do you need to know? My spirit remains in your midst, verse 5. Literally, uh, he, he is standing or remaining in your midst. And we don't have time to look at this, but even the prophet's voice, Haggai's voice among them, was evident that evidence that God's spirit was among them. Because when the spirit in Moses was spread among the leaders of Israel, they prophesied. And so the prophecy coming was evidence that God's spirit was among them. And for these reasons, they're told not to fear. And then in verses 6 through 9, they're given more reasons. The more reasons, the rationale why they shouldn't uh, fear next has to do with God's present presence. So my spirit remains among you. That's what that's about. It's present. Uh, it's my spirit, so it's personal. And he remains, which means it's proximate or close. So God is present among them right now in person through his spirit. And he is here, remaining here, in your midst, so he's close. And finally, the, the last motivation or reason, rationale, why they should not fear and be courageous has to do with God's future plans. God's future plans involve a temple. Just notice in verse 6, For thus says Yahweh of hosts, once more in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. And I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the desirable things of all nations. And I will fill this house with glory, says Yahweh of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares Yahweh of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says Yahweh of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. What's the point? The temple plays a part in God's future plans. This house, we saw that and actually see that in this passage four times. Verse 3, he makes reference to this house. Verse 7, this house. Verse 9, this house and this place. Uh, Charles Feinberg helpfully says, from God's viewpoint, there was only one house of the Lord on Mount Zion, whether it was the temple built by Solomon, Zerubbabel, or Herod later on. He always calls it the same house or this house. So identifies that same building with his temple. So the temple plays a role in God's future plan. It will be God's house. Verse 7, it will receive tribute because he says the desirable things of the nations will come and I will fill this house with glory, either a reference to the treasures that are in view or God's glory, glorious presence, you know, the glory cloud that filled the temple in 1 Kings 7 when Solomon built it. He's saying the same thing's going to happen here again. But verse 9 also says that it would be greater. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. But notice, remember, they're looking at a house that doesn't have that glory. They built it. It's not glorious. So even in this, they're being informed there's a greater another plan for the temple. This isn't the final construction. This one's not glorious. There's going to be one that even exceeds in glory Solomon's temple. So this isn't the end of the story. There's more to come. He's making them look forward. And again, according to verse 9, there would be peace. 
Notice that these future plans, God's future plans, also include shaking, shaking, and that's a little weird. In a couple weeks, in our evening service, um, I want to address this shaking a little more thoroughly. We'll talk about what Haggai and the other prophets thought about this unshakable city and what what's associated with this shaking in, in the end times. So if you're interested, come back in a couple weeks when we talk about Haggai and evening service. But just notice here in this passage, the shaking happens to absolutely everything. The heavens, the earth in verse 7, or in verse 6, the sea and the dry land. So this is universal shaking. The, everything on, in the world is getting shaken and moved. This is seismic activity that's in view, and the nations are included. And when the nations are shaking, that culminates in or gives way to those same nations then coming and bringing the desirable things that they possess into the house. Verse 8, silver, gold are in view. And so that just leaves the the final aspects of God's future plans. The temple, the shaking, and the timing is the last element, the timing. When is all of this going to happen? I'll tell you when it's not going to happen. Go to Revelation 21. What's not in view is the new heavens and the new earth. This is easy from what John records in like, Three years, Smet will get here. John says, in verse 1 of chapter 21 of Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. And I saw the holy, holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband, etc. Jump down to verse 22. What happens in the, what else does John not see? What else is not present in the new heavens and the new earth? A temple. And I saw no sanctuary in it. Why? For the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. There's no house of God. There's no sanctuary. There's no temple in the new heavens and the new earth. So what Haggai is describing when the temple plays a role, and whenever this happens, the glory of the nations coming into the temple, this is not the new heavens and the new earth. It's not the eternal state. Explicitly stated in verse 6 is when this will happen. Once more in a little while. That's as explicit as God gets. Just wait for it. It's coming. In a little while. It's imminent. It will take place. And it's soon. From God's perspective. And here we are. Some 2,543 years past Haggai's day. From God's perspective, that's a little while because this day hasn't come yet. This this context says, and I'll just give you the other markers of the timing, it's marked by seismic activity. Well, when the entire earth is shaken, that hasn't happened yet either. No worldwide earthquake. It's also preceded by the tribute of the nations. The nations are not today bringing tribute into God's house in Jerusalem. This day has not come. It's while the temple stands, because they're going to bring tribute into the temple, so the temple has to be there. That house today, not Israel's, in, in Israel's control, controlled by Muslims, and the Dome of the Rock. This is also followed by a more glorious temple than Solomon's. That hasn't happened. That's not the case. And just notice verse 9, 
this weekend bore witness to the fact that this day hasn't come yet because he says, in this place, I will give what? Peace. Israel is not at peace. So we're still waiting for this day. Let me tell you how you can wait well for that kingdom that is coming. Like Haggai's people in Haggai's day, you can wait well for that coming kingdom after the entire earth is shaken by obeying God in the small things today. Not because you will be saved by your works, but like Haggai's people who responded in faith, if you believe God, then you too will respond in faith and obey the Lord. And we'll see how all of this culminates next week as we finish the book. I'm going to just tell, tell the band, you don't have to come up. We're way over time. I'm going to pray and, and then dismiss us. God, you are good and you do good. So teach us your statutes. Make us learn how to embrace your work in our lives and go about in this life with a view of the future, just faithfully putting one foot in front of the other, laboring in the small, inglorious acts of obedience because we recognize that you are worthy. King Jesus, you are worthy of our obedience and you have promised great promises that do not depend on the greatness of our obedience. But you are kind, you are gentle, you are lowly, and you are eager to receive even the smallest acts that we offer up to you in faith. And so we thank you for being such a great God, such a humble king who is glad to receive the obedience of his people whenever it's done out of a heart of faith. And I pray that you would make Grace Bible Church and Grace Bible Church NOLA a people who faithfully pursues obedience to you because we love you, we fear you, and we are eager to draw near to you in faith. Also that we would receive a kingdom that is coming when we will be your people and you will be our God and you will dwell among us in all of your splendor. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.